My Memories of Liszt by Alexander Zelotti Authorized translation from the Russian Published by Medvin Simpson Limited, 1913 Narrated by Penny Johnson My Memories of Liszt While I was still a student at the Moscow Conservatorium, Nicholas Rubinstein, under whom I was studying at the time, decided that after finishing my course there, I ought to go abroad, preferably to Liszt, whom he knew personally. In the end of the year 1880, Rubinstein fell dangerously ill and had to go to Paris for treatment. I went to say goodbye to him the day before he left, accompanied by my teacher and guardian, Nicholas Zverev, with whom I lived during the eight years I spent at the conservatorium. Nicholas Rubinstein made me play him Liszt's Norma Fantasia, and it happened, strangely enough, that I was the last pianist he ever heard. I do not remember how I played, well or badly, but I do remember that Rubinstein was unusually silent as he sat listening. When I had finished, he turned to Zverev and said, Pupils like this make me sorry that I cannot stay at the conservatorium. And I thought his eyes filled with tears. Then he turned to me and said, Now let us have some wine and clink glasses, then you can go home. Some red wine was brought, and he poured out two glassfuls. "'In case I never come back at all,' he added in a very low voice, "'you must learn Liszt's Danse Macabre. Do not study under any other professor, but take your final examination at once. When you have learnt the Danse Macabre, you may, if you like, play it through to Serge Taneyev, and ask his advice. But do not play it to anyone else. Now, let us have our wine. You have seen us and our ways. Take pattern by us. Love women and wine, but, above all, be a gentleman. Do you understand? I understand, Nikolai Grigorievich, I replied, speaking very low and feeling awed and strangely moved by his words. The next day he went to Paris, where he died on the 11th of March, O.S. On the 12th, the first panide was held at the conservatorium. I shall remember it all my life. Our priest, the celebrated Dmitri Razumovsky, began his address by saying, We are met together to pray for Nicholas Rubinstein. And there his address ended. He began to sob, and so did the mixed assembly of mourners, among whom were Rubinstein's pupils. In May I passed my final examination. There were only five or six finishing pupils, and I remember I was the last to play. Ivan Tourniev was present, the board of directors having elected him, if I remember rightly, to be their honorary president. Tourniev was very kind to me. He kissed me after I had played, and said I must come to Paris, where he would introduce me into the musical world and help me in every way. I had no opportunity of profiting by his kindness, for when I did go to Paris, he had been dead many years. After I had finished at the conservatorium, the question of my going abroad came up for discussion between Zverev and the directors of the Moscow section of the Imperial Russian Musical Society. I was kept out of the way and knew nothing about it at all. Zverev weighed and decided everything for me. It was finally settled that until I went abroad, my journey being planned for the spring of 1893, I should take advantage of Anton Rubinstein's offer to give me lessons each time he came over to conduct the symphony concerts at Moscow, a task he had undertaken as a tribute to his brother's memory. The next time I saw Zverev, I heard that Rubinstein wished me to prepare the following works for my first lesson, which was to be in six weeks' time. Schumann's Chrysleriana, 
Beethoven's Concerto in E-flat, and the Sonata Op. 101 in A, as well as Chopin's Sonata in B minor. As he knew that I had played none of these things before, it was, to say the least of it, innocent on his part as a pedagogue to set so formidable an array of pieces to be learnt in six weeks. However, by dint of slaving seven or eight hours a day, I did actually master them as far as the notes were concerned. How well I remember that first lesson. Rubinstein had told me to bring Chrysleriana. Armed with this, I arrived, expecting to be alone with him, but I found myself confronting about fifteen elegantly dressed ladies. I was greatly surprised, and felt nervous at having to take my lesson under such unsuitable conditions, particularly as I had only prepared the music mechanically. I must have behaved as if I were on the verge of a precipice, or as if I had received the death sentence. I certainly sat down feeling like a condemned criminal. Play, said Anton Rubinstein curtly, and I began, expecting him to stop me after the first number and make some remarks. Not so, however. He said nothing, but fidgeted in his chair, turning from one side to the other and running his fingers through his mane. Instinctively I felt that my fate was sealed. I went on playing with despair in my soul, convinced that I was lost whatever I might do. I finished. Silence. Suddenly Rubinstein asked, in a voice that was both stern and angry, "'What is it you have been playing?' I sat still, and wondered why he had asked me. Did he not know the piece? As I made no reply, he repeated the question, raising his voice. I then told him the name of the piece, in a subdued tone. "'I know that. But what else?' he said. Then I remembered about the violinist Chrysler and said, Schumann wrote this in honor of his friend Chrysler. And why did Schumann not write a Rubensteiniana or a Zelotiana? At this I was absolutely nonplussed. Smoothing his hair again with a pretty gesture, he proceeded, because Chrysler was a wonderful man who possessed great poetic feeling, combined with a tremendous amount of temperament. What you have to do is to play so that everybody realizes this. Then, coming to the piano, he played as perhaps he had rarely played in his life before. Not that one could learn anything from it. I, as a pianist, did not exist for him, or if I did, no more than if I had been a pile of rubbish in a corner of the room. The effect, I remember, was to make me feel, let me alone. I shall never study music any more. All the same, insignificant as I was made to feel, I was offended. I recalled the method of Nicholas Rubinstein, which was to play to his pupils in such a way that they could realize the ideal he set before them. He always took into consideration the amount of talent each one possessed, and played so that the pupil never lost hope of being able some day to play as well as he did. The better the pupil, the better Nicholas Rubinstein's playing. I had other lessons of the same order from Anton Rubinstein, and as I look back, they seem like a nightmare even now. I felt that he was absolutely indifferent to what I played or how I played. There was naturally no question of enjoyment, either for him or for me. He did not actually teach me anything. He only gave a super-inspired rendering of the music, and if the desire to learn was not killed in me, it was due to my happy disposition, which allowed me to regard these lessons as a temporary evil. Zverev, I remember, felt the same about them. After each lesson he talked to me in a peculiar way, as if he were making excuses for having made me study under such a master. Anton Rubinstein thought it desirable that I should go abroad and study under Liszt, and the directors of the Moscow section of the Imperial Russian Musical Society decided to send me at their own expense, as I had no means of my own, in memory of Nicholas Rubinstein, 
and in response to Zverev's request. Later on, after a scandalous affair, which I shall presently describe, Zverev told me that I had been given unlimited credit. I could spend what I liked on the sole condition that I kept an account of my expenditure. Zverev also pointed out to the directors that as I was fond of playing cards, I might fall into the hands of card sharpers and be unable to pay my losses. He therefore insisted that, unless they would guarantee a sum of money to cover any such losses, my mother would not let me go abroad. Alexeyev, later prefect of Moscow, who was at that time president of the board of directors, agreed to this stipulation and guaranteed, in addition to the other money, ten thousand rubles, a thousand pounds, to meet the contingency. Of these arrangements I knew nothing at the time, but incredible as were the conditions under which I went abroad, I was to be placed in even more extraordinary circumstances before a year had passed, though they represented the opposite extreme. In the winter of 1882-83, the Imperial Russian Musical Society's concerts at Moscow were conducted by Erdmannsdorfer, who was very much liked both by the directors and by the public, a fact which to this day I fail to understand. His wife had studied under Liszt, and they offered to take me abroad with them and introduce me to him. It was arranged that we should go to Leipzig for the musical festival of the Allgemeine Deutsche Musikverein, in which Liszt was taking part. We started in the beginning of April, 1883, going straight to Leipzig, where we arrived three days before the beginning of the festival. I did not know a word of German, not even the words in everyday use. On one of these days, in the afternoon, I was sent to call on Fräulein Marie Lipsius, Lamara, an authoress and a friend of Liszt, about whom she wrote many articles. It was here that I was introduced to Liszt. He asked me in French what I was going to play to him. I named the Danse Macabre, and this pleased him because, as I afterwards heard, it was one of his favorites. I played it, and he said I did credit to my teacher. Both Bülow and Nicholas Rubinstein had played the piece, he added, Rubinstein the better of the two. He also said that he would be glad if I would come and stay at Weimar and study with him. I did not see him again at Leipzig, but a few days later, after the festival was over, the Erdmannsdorfers and I went to Weimar, where we stayed at an hotel. The first evening they went to call on Liszt while I stayed at home. The next morning they departed for Bavaria, after having taken a room for me into which I was to move that evening. My lesson was fixed for four o'clock. They left about eleven o'clock, and I began to feel afraid of staying quite by myself in a foreign country where I knew no one, especially as I only spoke French and not a word of German. At one o'clock I had to go to table d'hôte, and my heart sank at the prospect of sitting among strangers who spoke in an unknown tongue, and might even, awful thought, catechize me. Summoning up all my courage, I went down and took my place at table, with an expression in my face which must have said as plain as words, "'Please ignore me. Pretend I am not there.' We began dinner, but after the soup I felt sobs rising. I wanted to prove myself a man, however, and forced myself to stay until the meat came. But before the course was finished I sprang to my feet and, rushing to my room, buried my face in my pillow and sobbed aloud for forty minutes without ceasing. During these forty minutes I came to the decision to return to Russia that evening. Having exhausted my tears, I wrote out two telegrams, one to my mother, the other to Zverev, to say that I could not live abroad and was leaving for Russia the same night. The decision made, I felt relieved, and looked at the people about me as if I were sitting in a station merely waiting for my train. I packed up my belongings, not for my new quarters, but for Russia, and, taking with me Chopin's ballade in A-flat, I went to list for my lesson. 
As I approached the house, the same sinking sensation which I had experienced at table came over me again, and I went into my lesson as to a final ordeal before I started back to Russia. Liszt said good morning to me very kindly. There were about twenty-five pupils present. Somebody played something, I do not remember what it was. Then came my turn. I sat down and began the ballade, but I had only played two bars when Liszt stopped me, saying, "'No, don't take a zitz bath on the first note.' He then showed me what an accent I made on the E-flat. I was quite taken by surprise. "'Si, signor, si, signor,' said Liszt in Italian, smiling a trifle maliciously. I continued playing, but he stopped me several times and played over certain passages to me. When I got up from the piano, I felt bewitched. I looked at Liszt and was conscious of a gradual change in myself. My whole being became suffused by a glow of warmth and goodness, and by the end of my lesson I could not believe that only two hours before I had packed my things and wanted to run away. I left Liszt's house a different being, and was convinced that I should, after all, stay and study with him. All my trouble, the feeling of loneliness and helplessness, arising from my ignorance of the language, flew away as if at the touch of a magic hand. I had become all at once a man who knew his own mind. I realized that there was a sun to whose rays I could turn for warmth and comfort. That same evening I moved into my new room. I don't know how I spoke to the people of the house, but somehow we managed to understand each other, and thus I became a Weimarite. To describe Liszt's lessons in such a way as to give an idea of his personality would be impossible. It is necessary to see certain things in certain people if one would have a clear impression of them. There were thirty or forty of us young fellows, and I remember that, gay and irresponsible as we were, we looked small and feeble beside this old man, shrunken with age. He was literally like a sun in our midst. When we were with him, we felt the rest of the world to be in shadow, and when we left his presence, our hearts were so filled with gladness that our faces were, all unconsciously, wreathed in rapturous smiles. The lessons took place three times a week, on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, from four to six o'clock. Anybody who wished could come and have a lesson without paying a farthing. Liszt remembered his own desire, when quite a boy, to enter the Paris Conservatoire, and the refusal to admit him on the part of the director, Carabini, because he was a foreigner. This refusal, he said, made such an impression on him that he vowed to himself that if ever he became a great musician, he would give lessons without taking any payment. It was practically a condition that men should come to the lessons not in frock coats, but wearing lounge jackets, and that ladies should be simply dressed, the idea being that the poorer pupils should not feel uncomfortable beside the richer ones. Liszt's lessons were of a totally different order to the common run. As a rule, he sat beside, or stood opposite to, the pupil who was playing, and indicated by the expression of his face the nuances he wished to have brought out in the music. It was only for the first two months that he taught me in front of all the other pupils. After that I went to him in the morning when I was working at any specially big thing, and he taught me by myself. I always knew so thoroughly what I wanted to express in each piece of music that I was able to look at Liszt's face all the time I was playing. No one else in the world could show musical phrasing as he did, merely by the expression of his face. If a pupil understood these fine shades, so much the better for him. If not, so much the worse. Liszt told me that he could explain nothing to pupils who did not understand him from the first. He never told us what to work at. Each pupil could prepare what he liked. All we had to do when we came to the lesson was to lay our music on the piano. Liszt then picked out the things he wished to hear. There were only two things we were not allowed to bring. Liszt's second rhapsody, 
because it was too often played, and Beethoven's Sonata Quasi Una Fantasia, which Liszt in his time had played incomparably, as was afterwards proved to me. Neither did he like any one to prepare Chopin's scherzo in B flat minor, which he nicknamed the governess scherzo, saying that it ought to be reserved for those people who were qualifying for the post of governess. Everything else of Chopin's, particularly his preludes, he delighted in hearing. He insisted on a poetical interpretation, not a salon performance, and it irritated him when the groups of small notes were played too quickly conservatorium fashion, as he called it. Liszt called Chopin the only pianoforte poet, and always said that each note of his music was a pearl dropped from the skies. In speaking of Chopin, he once told us, We were great friends. Both as a musician and as a man, he was fragile and delicately constituted. He liked me very much as a pianist, but considered that he played some things as, for instance, his study in F-sharp, opus 25, better than I did. I suggested having a bet on it. We were to invite a party of our friends to hear us both play this study. Then we were to sit in an adjoining room where they could hear without seeing us, and were then to decide which of us had played first. Chopin accepted the bet, and our friends came. We each played the study as arranged. I played first, then Chopin, when we put the question to our audience, they unanimously decided that Chopin had played first. He would not give in, however. You play it differently, quand même, he insisted. It was I who introduced him to Georges Sand. As she gave him her hand and made the usual complimentary remarks, I saw something flash across his face, something that was like a streak of lightning. It made me feel I was witnessing a fateful meeting. Poor Chopin! His fine nature could not stand the strain. Later, after the death of Chopin and all that had gone before it, I was lunching alone with Georges Sand. Well, I said, it is through you that Mousset and my Chopin have perished, but you see I have endured, and thank God I am living still. Liszt hardly ever scolded anyone. He had a favorite expression, the one word, Good! but he sometimes said it in such a tone that no word could have been more offensive. This manner of his gave some people the mistaken impression that Liszt was not genuine, as he did nothing but pay compliments. But it was the people who had seen him for a few moments only who said this. When he was irritated by anyone's playing, he always said, I know half a dozen pianists who play this as well as you, and half a dozen more who play it better. It was still worse if he said, even the princess plays it better. Sometimes he worked himself into quite a frantic state of mind, but I only saw him in this condition about four times during the three years I was with him. On these occasions he strode to and fro in his room in a way that reminded me of Salvini as Otello, where he paces up and down Desdemona's bedroom like a tiger in the last act. In moments such as these, Liszt was simply terrifying. His face was Mephistophelian, and he would literally scream at the unlucky pupil. I take no payment from you, but if I did, there is no money which could give you the right to come and wash your dirty linen here. I am not a washerwoman. Go to the conservatorium. That is the place for you. This state of mind would last some time, about ten minutes. Afterwards, when we were more intimate, I always began talking to him at these times to divert his thoughts. I have already said that any one could become a pupil of his, but he was not at all pleased when people brought him letters of introduction, even though they might be from musicians, while letters from crowned heads simply infuriated him and prejudiced him instantly against the bearers. I remember a young man who came once, dressed with great care in a smart frock coat, Liszt glanced at his clothes with a grimace and asked, "'Where do you come from?' "'Meister, I should like to study with you. I have brought a letter from the Queen of Holland.' Liszt frowned, put the letter in his side pocket without reading it, and said, "'Play first. We will read the letter afterwards.' 
I knew by List's face that he had taken the bit between his teeth. First he made two other pupils play while he walked up and down full of nervous irritation. Then he turned to the newcomer with a chilling smile and an ominous note in his voice. "'And now, young man, will you play something?' Unfortunately, the young man's playing did not come up to his appearance. It was pretty, but rather amateurish. List paced the room nervously, and then broke out with, "'Instead of carrying round letters of introduction from queens, it would be better if you did some serious practicing. This is no place for you. You had better go to some other master, or, best of all, to the conservatorium. Take your letter with you. It may be of service, and I have no use for it.' A minute later the young man was gone, and I never saw him again. But List could also say pretty things that left a bitter taste, as the following incident shows. Mr. X, a composer, had come to Weimar to play one of his own compositions. The music showed talent, but was obviously influenced by List's works, particularly by his Faust symphony. We all, List too, were present at the performance. At the end of the season in September, when our lessons came to an end, with Liszt's departure to Rome, we used to bring him photographs of himself and ask him to sign them, and this time Mr. X brought the score of the Faust Symphony for him to write his name on. I happened to be standing by Liszt at the moment, and when I saw that he was writing quite a sentence, I retired to the far side of the room. When Liszt had finished, he showed it to Mr. X, and I saw a look of satisfaction come into the composer's face. As he passed near to me, he asked if I should like to read the delightful inscription. I went as far as the ante-room with him and read these words. To Mr. X, who is capable of composing something similar to this, or even improving it. As a rule, Liszt got up at four o'clock in the morning. Two hours later he went back to bed, rising for the day at eight o'clock. He dined at one, and then slept for about an hour and a half. He went to bed about ten o'clock at night. The early morning was his favorite time for composing. In former years his housekeeper told me this was his time for reading the critics, as he always called them, on his compositions. It always made him angry if anyone boasted of having had a good critique. If you have a good critique, he would say, you probably have a good certificate from the conservatorium, too. List once wittily defined a critic. There were three of us with him, Friedheim, a lady whose name I do not remember, and myself. List wanted a game of whist, but Friedheim objected that he did not know how to play and understood absolutely nothing about it. Then, said List, you must be a critic. He told me an amusing story of two English ladies who paid him a very early visit one morning. It was half past five when my man told me that two English ladies wished to see me. As I was in a very good humor, I told him to show them in. Two tall, thin ladies entered, each carrying a Baedeker in her hand. They told me that they were passing through Weimar, that their train left in half an hour, and that they did not want to go away without seeing List himself. I thanked them for their courtesy. They began to exchange glances, and I could see they wanted to ask me something. "'What do you want?' I inquired. "'Oh, Mr. List, we should love you to play something. "'It would be the greatest joy for us to hear you.' "'With pleasure. What would you like to hear?' "'They again exchanged glances, and one of them ventured, "'Whatever you play best.' "'Laughing, I sat down and played Moschlis's chromatic study. "'When I had finished, they nodded approvingly and said with one accord, "'Good, very good, you really play.' very well. I was beginning to be bored by this visitation, when suddenly they produced a thick album, saying, "'Won't you be kind enough to give us your signature?' I did not like this, and refused rather curtly. I don't know what they thought, but they answered, "'You misunderstood us.' This was a phrase List never could bear. Then I shouted at them, "'I never misunderstand anything. There is the window.' 
and there is the door. Choose which way you like. Without a word they rose and went away, and I went on laughing long after they left. By the time I had had two or three lessons, I instinctively felt that I was sympathetic to Liszt. During the lessons, while he was walking up and down, he paused beside me more and more frequently, and when any one played well, he would look at me with a glance of approval. Every time I went away, too, he said good-bye with peculiar kindness. After a short time, he began to ask me whether I were free after my lesson, and, if so, whether I should not like to stay behind with him. I desired this above all things, for Arthur Freetime and Alfred Riesenauer, two of his oldest pupils, often stayed. But my fear of being too forward was just as strong as my desire to stay, and I replied each time that I was engaged, though I thanked him very much, longing all the time in the depths of my heart for him to ask me again. This happened a few times until, finally, he grew tired of it, or perhaps he understood my motives of delicacy. However that may be, he came to me during one of the lessons and said, "'You will stay with me afterwards.' His manner was such that I did not dare to make any protest, and could only bow without being able to hide my pleasure at his words. I remember very clearly the excitement that possessed me on realizing that I was so soon, that very day, to be one of Liszt's guests. The lesson came to an end, everybody else went away, and I stayed behind with Liszt. Soon after, two ladies came in. Marie Lipsius, at whose house I first met Liszt, was one, Fräulein Marie Breidenstein, a singer, the other. Liszt introduced me, saying, This is not my pupil, but Nicholas Rubinstein's. I am merely finishing him. We then sat down to whist. I was glad I knew the game, and took my place at the card table with great satisfaction. But no sooner had I done so than the consciousness that I, Zelotti, was sitting beside Liszt, and about to play cards with him, brought on, I remember, just such a nervous trembling as I have felt when playing on a concert platform. We began to play. Liszt asked Marie Lipsius to be his partner, and I sat on his left and played with Fräulein Breidenstein. The excitement made my hands shake, so that I could not hold my cards firmly. In the third or fourth game, Liszt declared trumps, and I saw by my own cards that he could not win. "'Meister, you will take no tricks,' I said impulsively. I understood at once from his expression that my remark was out of place. I was told afterwards that Liszt only played for love, always wanted to win, and did not like losing. He said rather dryly, "'Young man, keep calm.' I began to regret not having refused his invitation this time, too. All my delight vanished. A silence fell upon us, and we finished the game without speaking. I wanted to play so that Liszt should win, and yet it seemed to me insulting to treat him as a child. I remember how reluctantly and with what a heavy heart I covered his cards and took the tricks. The game ended, and it was now Liszt's turn to deal. As he shuffled the cards, he turned to his neighbor, my vis-a-vis, -vis, and said in a sarcastic voice, "'Do you know the story of the celebrated Dresden comedian?' She replied in the negative. "'Oh, it is a charming story. He was a great artist, and was very popular in Dresden. He went abroad to act, and on his return was asked, "'Well, did you have a great success?' "'Yes, very great,' was the reply. "'And did you make much money?' "'Yes, a great deal.' "'Did you learn anything?' "'No, I learned nothing, but I became arrogant.' With that, Liszt darted a glance at me and laughed a real Mephistophelian laugh. I remember I pressed hard upon my chair in the hope of inducing the floor to open and swallow me up. I was quite stupefied, and I lowered my eyes, for I could feel Liszt looking at me. 
When I looked up again, it seemed to me that he was pleased to see I had understood for whom the speech was intended, as it showed I had really learnt something. I never forgot this incident. As time went on, when we had become more intimate, and I felt I knew him better, he still said things occasionally with such an expression that I did not know whether to take them literally or not. But I had only to quote the words, I did not learn anything, but I became arrogant, for his face to clear, and the indefinable expression to give place to a kind, friendly smile. During my summer at Weimar I began to make rather frequent journeys to Leipzig, where I was paying attentions to the sister of one of Liszt's pupils. I was only nineteen, and this courtship so absorbed me that I stopped writing to my mother. The result was that my mother wrote to Liszt to ask what I was doing. One day at a lesson, Liszt came up to me and said, "'Come here. I want to speak to you.' We went into an adjoining room, his bedroom. I can recall distinctly the severe way in which it was furnished. There was a bed near it on the wall, a crucifix, a metal washstand, and two chairs. Liszt suddenly became serious as he asked me gravely, "'Tell me, please, when did you last write to your mother?' It dawned on me at once that I had not written for a long time, but I lied coolly, saying that I had written the day before, having decided in my own mind, of course, to write that very evening. Liszt looked at me penetratingly as if he knew I had lied to him, and said in a strange voice, severe and yet paternal, which I had never heard before, "'Now, my dear boy, don't do this again, because your mother has written to tell me she is anxious about you. You are young, and there is one thing you should remember. I am seventy-three years old, and have lived my life happily enough, but it is entirely owing to the fact that I have always been a good son to my mother. Remember what I say.' His words had a tremendous effect upon me. The intimacy of the scene, there was no one in the room but our two selves, his words, and the strange note in his voice, which I only heard once more shortly before he died, all combined to make an impression which will never lose its freshness for me as long as I live. In the course of my life I have come across many charming personalities among musicians, but never, either before or since, have I seen any one as impressive as Liszt. You had only to say good morning to him to know, instantly and instinctively, that there was something majestic, godlike in him, to feel that he was a great, all-embracing spirit. He had his own special manner of saying good morning to a lady— he pressed his left hand to his heart, and bowed with such an affecting air of chivalrous respect that the onlookers were overcome with admiration. I was telling Charles Davidoff's wife about this, and she teased me a little, saying that I found the sight so melting because I was very young. It so happened that soon after this conversation, Davidoff and his wife came to Weimar in the summer of 1884, I think. They notified me of their arrival, and I, in my turn, told Liszt. He asked them to come and see me at a certain time, and I went a little beforehand to fetch them. I was anxious to see what sort of an impression Liszt would make on Madame Davidoff, and warned her beforehand that she would be conquered at once by his way of greeting her. We arrived, and Liszt bowed in his usual manner while I stood by watching her. "'You are quite right.' she said, turning to me. I could never have imagined, and have certainly never seen anything like it. That evening Liszt and Davidoff played the Rubinstein Sonata in D, and as we listened to these two playing, we young people realized at the time that, as a performance, it was historic. It was only occasionally that Liszt played a whole piece through to us, the usual thing was for him to sit down and show us a single passage, but even that he only did for some of his pupils, the eight or ten out of the thirty or forty present who actually played. 
the residue was made up for the greater part of English and American women, in great variety, who merely formed an audience. This did not prevent them, however, from calling themselves Liszt's favorite pupils. Apparently he had none but favorite pupils. I once heard Liszt play the Schubert Liszt Fantasia through from beginning to end, with Clindworth playing the orchestral part. I have retained the clearest impression of this rendering, and have always tried to play it myself in the same spirit. Liszt only played once in public in my time. It was in Dresden at a charity concert given by Marie Goetze, a singer and reciter. Liszt played two of his Consolations and the pianoforte part of his mellow declamation Lenora. He told me he was proud of being the only pianist who had given up playing at the right time. I was forty-five years old when I stopped giving concerts, he said. Everybody was indignant and insisted that it was too soon, but, in fact, I acted prudently. I did not wish to hear afterwards that I had gone on playing too long, which is what many people are now saying of Rubinstein. It was very hard for me to leave the concert platform, for it needs a strong effort of will to make a decision of that sort, but although I no longer played professionally, I still gave my services for charity, as performances of that order are never criticized. It is impossible to describe Liszt's playing. A pianist myself, I am yet unable to show how he played, or to give an idea of his playing in words. I cannot say that he had a big tone. It was rather that when he played there was no sound of the instrument. He sat at the very piano which we young fellows used to break with our playing, an entirely unreliable, unequal instrument. But he would produce from it, discordant as it was, music such as no one could form any idea of without hearing it. I am a tremendous admirer of Anton Rubinstein's playing, and consider that all we living pianists are mere pygmies compared with him. He used to say, however, as I was told, that he was worth nothing as a pianist compared with Liszt. Liszt once told me a story of a banquet given in Vienna for Rubinstein after his historical concerts, Liszt himself being present. A member of the committee gave Rubinstein as the first toast. He had scarcely finished speaking when Rubinstein, who had been nervously fidgeting during the speech, sprang to his feet crying, how can you drink my health or do me honor as a pianist when Liszt is sitting at the same table? We are all corporals, and he is the one and only field marshal. I had faith in this story, but had always wanted to compare the two pianists for myself. It was not long before an opportunity occurred. Anton Rubinstein was giving one of his historical recitals one morning at the Gewandhaus for the musicians of Leipzig, and I went to hear him, acting on the advice of Liszt. I was to go back to Weimar after the concert and tell him all about it. It was a recital of Beethoven's sonatas. Rubinstein was at his best and played each one better than the last. I was particularly struck with his rendering of the Moonlight Sonata, which seemed to me simply marvellous. Two hours later, I was back at Liszt's house, arriving just at the beginning of a lesson. I could hardly wait to say good afternoon to Liszt before plunging into a breathless description of this amazing music, the glamour of which was still over me. Speaking with all the fervour and enthusiasm of youth, I told him how wonderful Rubinstein's execution had been, and that I had never heard such a fine rendering of the Moonlight Sonata. All at once it seemed to me that Liszt winced, and the thought flashed across my brain that I was saying this to a man who was acknowledged to be a specialist in the interpretation of this very sonata. He listened to my glowing account, and then said composedly, "'Very good, very satisfactory.' I began to feel uneasy. Liszt walked away and began to examine the music which the pupils had brought to play. Seeing a copy of the Moonlight Sonata amongst the pieces, he asked who was playing it. 
It turned out to be a young American lady. My dear child, said Liszt, looking at her, this piece must not be brought to the lessons. I allow no one to play it because, when I was young, it was my specialité. But as we are in a good humor today, I will play it to you. Saying which, he turned his head and, as I thought, gave me a look which meant, Now listen, you will hear something. He began to play, and I held my breath as I listened. Rubinstein had played on a beautiful Beckstein in a hall with very good acoustic properties. Liszt was playing in a little carpeted room in which small space thirty-five to forty people were sitting, and the piano was worn out, unequal, and discordant. He had only played the opening triplets, however, when I felt as if the room no longer held me. And when, after the first four bars, the G-sharp came in in the right hand, I was completely carried away. Not that he accentuated this G-sharp. It was simply that he gave it an entirely new sound, which even now, after twenty-seven years, I can hear distinctly. He played the whole of the first movement, then the second... The third he only commenced, saying that he was too old and had not the physical strength for it. I then realized that I had completely forgotten having listened to Rubinstein two hours before. As a pianist, he no longer existed. I make this statement deliberately with a full knowledge of what I am saying, and as my readers know my opinion of Rubinstein, they may thus gain some faint idea of what Liszt was as a pianist. When he had finished playing, Liszt got up and came across to me. I had tears in my eyes and was quite unstrung. I could only say, Meister, I am quite dazed. I never heard anything like it. Upon which he smiled kindly and said, We know how to play after all, eh? I now understood what Anton Rubinstein meant by calling himself a common soldier and list a general, and how true this estimate was. In my opinion, Liszt was as far removed from Rubinstein as Rubinstein from the rest of us. I have never played this sonata in public. In fact, I never heard it again, for if I happened to be at a concert hall where it was to be played, I always left the hall. It seemed to me that by listening to it, I should be soiling the impression I had received, insulting Liszt's memory, not to speak of the martyrdom it implied to myself. Liszt became more and more affectionate in his attitude towards me, both as a man and as a musician. He regarded my verdict upon any one as final, and he had his own original way of showing his regard for me as a pianist. During the summer of 1885, I had to live in Leipzig on account of the Listverein, and only came over to Weimar to take a lesson or to see Liszt. If I came into the room while the lesson was in progress, Liszt would say, Ah, we shall have some real piano playing again today. This sort of remark I found very embarrassing in the presence of my fellows, and I tried to get into the background or into a corner so as not to give Liszt any opportunity of speaking to me, but I was not always successful. I remember several occasions when, after playing over a passage to somebody, he suddenly turned to me and asked, right across the room, Do you play it like that? I understood, of course, perfectly that the question was only a complimentary one, but some of my friends there took it literally and supposed that Liszt was really asking my opinion. On these occasions, they accounted for Liszt's attitude by the resemblance I bore to his son. The first time I heard this mentioned, I could not help noticing, as a curious coincidence, that Liszt and I had moles in identically the same spot on our faces. When I asked Liszt if I were really like his son, he replied, Yes, you are very like Daniel. Then, stroking my head, he added with a soft, kind smile, But don't worry. I not only never had the pleasure of being presented to your mother, 
but I never saw her in my life, at which we both laughed very heartily. Liszt's confidence in me as a musician was not confined to the present, but extended to the future. I once brought the fourteenth rhapsody to play to him, telling him beforehand that I had dared to make some alterations in it, and even to omit certain passages, and that I wanted his opinion on it. After I had played it, he said, I not only acquiesce in, but thoroughly approve of what you have done, in proof whereof I give you my permission to make any alterations and omissions you wish, and this at any time, even after I am gone, for I know that what you consider necessary will not be detrimental to the music. Indeed, you may say in such cases that it is as I wished it. You have my sanction in advance to anything you may do in my name. Only, he added with a smile, please don't sign my checks. I once saw Liszt conduct an orchestra. He was not in any sense an ordinary conductor. Whether it was at Weimar or further afield, the orchestra had first to study the things they were going to play with their own conductor until they knew them almost by heart. The conductors were also near at hand to help the orchestra or chorus in dangerous moments while Liszt was conducting, such moments being not infrequent. For the greater part of the time, Liszt could hardly be said to conduct at all. His appearance at the conductor's desk was wonderfully imposing, his long, tightly buttoned abbe's cassock, his bushy mane of white hair, and his air of spirituality all combined to give him an unearthly appearance, as of a being from another world. Not only did he look gigantic, but he seemed to be soaring above us all, above the hall itself. He used no baton. In the soft parts, he would beat time almost imperceptibly, or not at all. When he had to make a big crescendo, he would suddenly spread out his long arms like an eagle, spreading his wings, and the effect was so morally uplifting that you felt impelled to rise from your seat. I wanted to give more practical proof of my adoration for Liszt himself and for his music. I was then, as I am to this day, an admirer of his compositions, and I was particularly anxious to produce his music in Leipzig, where Liszt was still quite unknown as a composer. During the autumn of my first year abroad, I decided to give a concert of his compositions. Liszt tried to dissuade me by saying that it would be very expensive and would give no pleasure to anyone. But, in spite of this, I decided to carry out my plan. First of all, I arranged a concert at the Weimar School of Music, which was to be a sort of rehearsal for the Leipzig performance. I played the A major concerto, the Danse Macabre, and the Dante Sonata, amongst other things. The Leipzig concert took place, if I remember rightly, in October 1883. I kept the best place in the hall for Liszt, it was in the parterre, and decorated his chair with greenery and flowers. Liszt came over for it with some of his pupils. Now I knew that in former days, when his affairs were in a more flourishing condition, he never went anywhere without paying the expenses of everybody who was with him. Any member of his party who went to the ticket office was met by Liszt's lackey and informed that his ticket was already taken. In the same way, all the hotel bills were paid by Liszt. This pleased me very much, and I made a mental note of it. Accordingly, when Liszt asked for the account, he was told that all the expenses of the party had been paid. He guessed at once what had happened, and said, Aha! We shall have to keep our eyes open with these Russians. Fine people they are. 
I told Liszt before the concert that a seat had been reserved for him in the middle of the hall, but he refused to sit there, saying that he would go upstairs to look on from a distance while I was hissed for playing such bad compositions. But after staying upstairs for the first part, and seeing that the audience was appreciating the concert, he came down and sat in the chair reserved for him during the second part. The concert was a great success, but this alone was not enough to satisfy my ambition. In the spring of 1885, I conceived the idea of founding a Listverein at Weimar. When I told Liszt, he was greatly astonished and tried to dissuade me from my purpose. Two hours after leaving him, I received one of his visiting cards inscribed as follows. The best policy for Weimar is to remain passive and keep to oneself. And so, dear Zelotti, let us have no list, Verein. After this note, I was obliged to give up Weimar, but I had, of course, no intention of giving up my idea. As Weimar was ruled out, I immediately decided to found the society in Leipzig, and said so to Liszt, who was horrified. Zelotissimus, he said, don't do that. You'll only make enemies and nothing else. I told him that the matter was quite settled, and also that I should be happy to be censured for my propaganda, as it would give me an opportunity of proving to him my love and attachment indeed. Whereupon he smiled and said, No good attempting to do anything with you. It is not for nothing I sometimes call you Rostopchin after the burner of Moscow, for you forge ahead quite regardless. My first step was to discuss the project with my friend and fellow student, Arthur Freetime, who, as an ardent Listianer, was very enthusiastic about the idea of founding the Listverein, and threw himself heart and soul into the task. Of the people whom we asked to be members of the committee, I remember Dias and Stavenhagen, pupils of Liszt, Arthur Nikisch and Gustav Kogel, the first and second conductors of the Leipzig Stadt Theater at that time, E. W. Fritsch, the editor of the Musicalicious Wochenblatt, and a friend of Wagner, Julius Blutner, son of the piano manufacturer, and Martin Krause, a music teacher, whom we later elected president of the society. First and foremost, the Listverein set out to arrange for the best possible performance of the two symphonies under Nikish. We had to collect money to meet the possible deficit, to which end we sought to increase the membership of the society and arranged chamber music recitals. During the season 1885-86, we gave the Liszt concert, on which our hearts had so long been set, in the Stadt Theater. The chief item on the program was the Faust Symphony. I do not remember the rest. To give the public an opportunity of knowing the symphony better, Friedheim and I played it on two pianos shortly before the concert, all those who had tickets for the concert being admitted free of charge. Nikish held five rehearsals of the symphony, and his performance was sheer genius. We had engaged the Stadt Theater with its orchestra for the concert, but were not paying extra for the separate rehearsals, and here Stegemann, the director, did us a good turn by putting on operas that required no rehearsing for the time being, thus setting the orchestra at liberty for our use. It was a stupendous success. Liszt was away from home, I forget where, and could not be present. Later on we gave a second concert, at which the Dante Symphony was played, but this was not until after Liszt's death. On that occasion I was so moved by Nikish's inspired interpretation that I presented him after the concert with the autograph score of the symphony as a token of recognition from the dead. I am bound to say our society, the Listverein, played an exceedingly important part in the musical life of Leipzig, 
It was the balm that awakened this life, and among other things prepared the way for Karl Reinecke's retirement and the engagement of Nikisch as his successor at the Gewandhaus concerts. Not that our society played this role deliberately. It was one of those moments of transition when life itself arranges for the right people to step in at the critical point just where they are needed. Liszt was evidently pleased to hear of my doings at Leipzig, for not only did he express his pleasure to his acquaintance, but he told me he had written to Gräfin von Wittgenstein about it. When I was starting for Antwerp, where I was going to play, he gave me a letter of introduction to the directors of the musical society there. He said he had long since given up writing letters of this description, as he had so often been taken in, but that on this occasion he had full confidence in my justifying his assurances. He had, indeed, complete confidence in me, and was always ready to defend me. I had an unfortunate habit of showing the indignation I felt, and as a result complaints were sometimes made to list about my sharp tongue. I remember once at Leipzig Herr Riedel, founder of the Riedel Verein, which still exists, came to see me and left his card, on which he had written a few words, saying he would like to see me on business and would be at home between three and four o'clock the following day. This annoyed me to such a degree that I wrote to him straight off to explain that I was really touched to think of his being at home from three to four o'clock, but that as he wanted to see me, he ought, according to the rules of our Russian etiquette, to have inquired when I should be at home. But the fact of my being at home must, I added, be as indifferent to him as his being at home was to me. The first time Liszt saw me after this, he asked, "'What did you say when you wrote to Riedel? He has been complaining about you.' I told him all about it. He smiled and said, "'It is quite right. People must learn to be careful how they treat us as a general thing. We are not just anybody.' On another occasion, the directors of the Allgemeine Deutsche Musikverein, of which Liszt was president, had asked me to play. There was a great lack of delicacy in the letter, although I don't remember exactly wherein it lay. In reply, I sent a telegram to Karlsruhe, where the festival was being held. Liszt was there at the time a telegram consisting, as I remember to this day, of fifty five words which, though couched in polite terms, completely annihilated those directors. When Liszt saw me on his return, he began to laugh. Oh, that telegram of yours! They brought it straight to me and began to complain about it. I told them you were quite right, and that they must not behave in that way. As a rule, he added, go on in the same way. And I still follow his advice when occasion arises. It was Liszt's endeavor throughout to preserve to artists their independence, which he regarded as sacred, and he would have us young artists assist him in this, teaching us by his own example. I remember giving a concert at Weimar, at which the Duke of Weimar intended to be present. Liszt, too, had promised to come, Three hours before the concert, I received a note from the Herzog's aide de camp asking me to postpone the beginning of the performance, as the Duke would not be able to come at the appointed time. This rubbed me up the wrong way, and I went to ask Liszt's advice. "'What nonsense!' he said. "'Begin at the time fixed. You must not be guilty of rudeness to the public.' It is the chief duty of rulers to have perfect manners, and if the duke does stop ruling half an hour earlier, no one will suffer. In the autumn of 1884, I told Liszt in the course of conversation that I wanted to have my photograph taken so that I could send a copy to Russia. 
he had once offered to be taken with me, saying that a photograph like that would be a nice memento for me. It was wonderful how Liszt saw a meaning in every detail. For instance, I wanted Liszt to be seated in the photograph while I sat on the floor at his feet. He would on no account allow this, the reason he gave being that he was old, had said his say, and might now sit down, but that I, being still young and with all my life before me, must be taken standing, as if in readiness to go forward. Complaints were often made to him that someone had passed himself off as his pupil, when it was not true, but Liszt's only reply was a shrug and a smile. One morning when I came to see him, he asked me to read him the newspaper. He had to pay a call and began to shave, meanwhile. I began to read a musical paper in which there was a letter from Stockhausen asking those people to whom anyone claiming to be his pupil should apply to demand a certificate to the effect that the bearer had really studied under him. No sooner had I finished the sentence than Liszt sprang from his seat, half his face being shaved, the other still lathered, and began to run to and fro, screaming, "'What a herd! Welk ein Bude! "'They tell me that I ought to give my pupils certificates. "'I don't care a straw what they say, "'for I know that out of a hundred pupils "'there will always be found three "'to support my reputation and bring me honour. "'During my first summer at Weimar, I went to Bayreuth to hear Parsifal, to which Liszt told me to listen with four ears. At Bayreuth I heard from other musicians, who were there for the performance, many unfavorable things about Wagner personally, and about his attitude to Liszt particularly during the last few years. The result of these stories was that I returned to Weimar filled with indignation against Wagner as a man, but with admiration for the music of Parsifal. I went to see Liszt as soon as I got back, and at the sight of this wonderful personality, all that I had heard about Wagner burned within me. We exchanged greetings, and I, being incapable then, as on former occasions, of suppressing my indignation, burst out with, Meister, the music of Parsifal is simply incredibly beautiful, but... Excuse my saying it, Wagner was not a very desirable person in any respect, and his behavior to you was really abominable. What made my outburst the more inexcusable this time was the possibility that the stories I had heard about Wagner were false, and the fact that I had abused a man whom Liszt adored, whereas I knew that Liszt never permitted an insult to people whom he liked in his presence. Having blurted it out, I bit my tongue, rather late, and waited, expecting to receive a severe reprimand. But Liszt looked at me very, very gravely, and said in a quiet voice, Gently, this must not be said aloud. I then felt instinctively that there was a grain of truth in the stories I had heard about Wagner. "'Very well,' I said. "'I will never speak of it again to you. "'But according to the theory of probabilities, "'I shall live the longer, "'and when I am left without you, "'I shall not keep silence.' "'I remember waiting in some agitation "'to hear what Liszt would say. "'He said nothing, however, "'but merely looked at me wistfully and quietly, "'as if it pained him not to be able to deny "'the truth of what I had said.' It was quite by chance that I witnessed Liszt's interview with Joachim. It was a day on which there were no lessons, and I was standing with Liszt by the piano, talking when a lackey interrupted us to announce Joseph Joachim. I made a move to go away, but Liszt stopped me, saying, Stay here. This will interest you, because it is, in a sense, a historic meeting between us. Liszt then explained to me in a few words that he had done a great deal for Joachim, as I afterwards learned 
He had given him pecuniary assistance and had helped to start him in his career, and that Joachim had not behaved very well to him. A minute later the door opened, and Joachim came in. He threw himself into List's arms, saying, "'How glad I am to see you!' List, with the manner of one who is anxious to ward off apologies or explanations, said, "'All right, all right, never mind about all that. Tell me how you are getting on yourself, what great things you have been doing.' Then began a conversation in which Joachim had only to reply while List interrogated. It was so evident from List's manner what he meant that I, as an onlooker, almost pitied Joachim. The conversation lasted about fifteen minutes, and in this quarter of an hour it became evident to Joachim and to me that List was not offended, that he had forgiven everything, and only regarded Joachim with the esteem due to a great artist. Just as he was leaving, List said, "'Now you are here, why not stop and see what our playing is like?' He then made me play. I realized in a half-conscious way that at that moment I stood to represent a school which Joachim would hardly recognize, and I played with special pleasure and stimmung. It seemed to me that Joachim was glad of the music, if only that it enabled him to sit in silence beside the man to whom he owed so much. Just after a visit from Cosima Wagner in the summer of 1884, Liszt gave me the following interesting account of his reconciliation with Wagner. After the marriage of Wagner and my daughter... I was for a long time on bad terms with him, so bad that we never met. I resisted all Cosima's appeals to become reconciled to him. Then one day I received a note from Wagner, written at the local inn Zum Elefanten. He wrote to say that he had just arrived at Weimar with his wife and that he wished to make a last effort at reconciliation. He begged me to come and make peace with him, saying that he would wait until I went to him, as he dared not come himself. At this all my real regard for him seemed to prompt me, and I decided to go. When I got there, Wagner met me with a speech, which lasted for about twenty minutes. There was no one to hear it but his wife and myself. It was a speech I shall never forget." I was so touched by it that I forgot all except the good side in him, and we finished supper at six o'clock the next morning, when I was brought home nearly unconscious from all the cognac I had drunk. After this story, I understood that Wagner's behavior must have been really ignoble, if Liszt, with his unlimited goodness and indulgence, could wish not to see him the man who was to him a positive idol, to whose service he had given himself without reserve. Liszt's feeling for Russian music was not merely liking, but adoration. All music coming from Russia was examined by him immediately, and he always said to me, Let us be quick and look at it. There is sure to be something good. The variations on... he called a musical picnic, and would sometimes ask us to play the picnic after the lessons. One of us had to play the variations while he played the theme, giving himself up to the enjoyment of each number. He very much liked tripping up any young musician who did not know the piece by the variation, the chimes. Showing him the two apparently simple pages, he would say with a tinge of malice, can you play that at sight? I was there once when Mr. Blank, who afterwards became a well-known pianist, was thus victimized. Of course, was his reply to the question. List exchanged glances with me, and we could neither of us help smiling. List sat down and asked Mr. Blank and me to take our places. 
We began, and of course Mr. Blank fell out at the second line. List laughed at this for a long time, being immensely pleased with his joke. It was at Weimar that I made the acquaintance of Glazunov and Borodin, to whose visit List looked forward as an event of great moment in our life at Weimar. He never missed an opportunity of insisting that Germany and France had had their say in music and that everything new must perforce come from Russia. The fact that music in Russia was mainly in the hands of foreigners made him very indignant, and he always told me that I ought to produce everything that was Russian when I took up my work there. As I said at the beginning, I was sent abroad at the expense of the Moscow section of the Imperial Russian Musical Society under quite regal conditions, but this mode of existence did not last long. Things fell out in this way. Erdmannsdorfer invited me to make my first appearance in Moscow after leaving Liszt at his benefit concert. But to Zverev, Erdmannsdorfer's popularity, which was, in my opinion, not justified, seemed an insult to the memory of Nicholas Rubinstein, and he thought it undesirable that a pupil of his and Rubinstein's should appear under the banner of Erdmannsdorfer. Zverev accordingly told the directors that it was impracticable to interrupt my studies for the sake of a single concert, and wrote to tell me that I must not think of going. I wrote to Erdmannsdorfer, telling him I could not come, laying the blame, of course, on Zverev. But, as transpired later, Erdmannsdorfer became angry with me personally, and proceeded to tell the directors that I drank champagne every day, did nothing, and was in the habit of sitting up until five in the morning. I drank no champagne, and went to bed at ten in the evening. One fine day in the spring of 1884, I received a letter from the directors to the effect that, from that time forward, they would supply me with no more money. Imagine my position! After being free to spend what I liked on the sole condition of keeping an account of my expenditure, I found myself thus suddenly and unexpectedly left without a farthing, with no explanation, moreover, of the why and wherefore. Even a criminal is allowed to speak in his own defense, but I was simply left stranded in a foreign country, absolutely without means, and there was an end of it. After enduring my martyrdom for a few days, I decided to send an officially worded request to the directors for a loan of three hundred roubles, as I had to make some money to enable me to change my rooms and alter my mode of living, generally. In reply I received a charming letter, in which I was informed that for a pupil like me, the directors of the Moscow section of the conservatorium had not three hundred roubles to spare. I do not know how to describe my state of mind at that time. Even now, after twenty-seven years, the insult still rankles. Just then, too, when the directors refused to help a pupil like me, I was, now I come to think of it, the one and only pianist among the pupils of Moscow Conservatorium who, in all the twenty years of its existence, was able to put on record a virtuoso career abroad. I went to Liszt and told him everything. He called their refusal disgraceful, and offered to lend me some money, which, of course, I declined. But my own righteous indignation and Liszt's condolences did not alter the fact that I was in a tight corner, and had to find a way out somehow. One not at all fine morning, as I was considering what to do, I found I had only fifty pfennigs in my purse. I felt I was lost, for the only things I could pawn were the gold sleeve links given me by Nicholas Rubinstein on the occasion of my first public appearance at the symphony concerts in Moscow in 1880. I had taken the place of Neupert, the pianist, who had been taken ill suddenly. These sleeve links I regarded as a talisman, and, being superstitiously inclined, 
I wanted to keep them at all costs. But as it was clearly impossible to be left with only fifty finnicks, I went out to pawn the links. I remember how I felt when I received the ticket and the eighteen marks. It was as if I had parted with some of my own flesh. So bereft did I feel without my links. I went home with dragging steps and lowered head. There I found a letter from Russia containing very unpleasant news. This coincidence preyed on me till I was utterly downcast. I went about all day as if in a dream. My nervous agitation increased so rapidly that by the evening I felt I must do something. I went to List's housekeeper, told her with sincere conviction that the absence of Nicholas Rubinstein's sleeve links was bringing me misfortune, and asked her to lend me twenty marks for a short time. She laughed at me very much for being so superstitious, but fulfilled my request. The next morning I set out joyfully to redeem my links, and came home with my soul at rest. As on the previous day, I found a letter awaiting me, but this time it contained good news. I was engaged to play at two concerts in Belgium, at a fee of nine hundred francs. I confess that the bad news I had received the moment the links had passed out of my possession, and the goodness attendant on their return, made a deep impression on me, and I somehow felt quite calm about my future. I never parted with the links again. I next decided to apply to the piano manufacturer, Julius Blutner, whose instruments I used. I wrote and told him that the directors of the Moscow section of the Imperial Russian Musical Society had placed me in an inextricable position and asked him to lend me four hundred marks. Two days later, I received a registered letter advising me to be careful and enclosing two hundred. It was the first time I had made such a request, and consequently the first time I had been refused. My amour propre was touched, and although I had only a mark or two in my pocket, I put those two hundred marks in another envelope and sent them back to Blutner, telling him that if I asked for four hundred, I meant four, and not two also that his advice to me to be careful, situated as I then was, only made me laugh. This was somewhat arrogant, I admit. It was certainly not politic. However that may be, the result was brilliant. Two days afterwards, I received another letter from Blutner, enclosing, this time, four hundred marks. I told List the whole story of our correspondence, and when he went to Leipzig to conduct the first performance of Cornelius's opera, The Barber of Baghdad, he thanked Blutner in his own name for his ready help to me. I am happy to be able to include in these memories of my life with Liszt this reference to Blutner, to whom I am incalculably indebted and incalculably grateful. For knowing the ill turn the directors had done me, he continued his assistance until I was set firmly on my feet. True, he uttered no extravagant phrases, gave no promises to my mother, placed no unlimited credit to my account. He simply helped a young, budding musician because it was natural to him to do good at any time, and because he believed that one day I should achieve something. For this I honor his memory with gratitude." The directors, on the other hand, found nothing better to do than to tell the correspondent of the Novoya Vremya that, after taking money from them for my stay abroad, I refused to come and play at their question mark, concert. The correspondent told the whole story in an article which appeared in Moscow, adding that he could not put into print the word which fittingly described my conduct. Actually, this correspondence did me a good turn, however, for when I went to St. Petersburg afterwards and called on Charles Davidoff, he made detailed inquiries into the origin of it all, 
and the explanation I gave him led to my engagement to play at a symphony concert conducted by Bulow. The name of Bulow is irresistibly linked with that of Tausig in my memory. These two were Liszt's most beloved pupils. When he spoke of them, his face became so radiant and his voice so charged with emotion that one felt at once the depth and power of his love for them. There were only two portraits standing on Liszt's writing table, one of the Gräfin Wittgenstein and one of Bülow. From these two he was never parted, even when traveling. He invariably spoke of Bülow as Dear Hans. Once while I was there, Bülow came to Weimar in the summer of 1884, I think, and Liszt was all excitement and happiness at the thought of seeing his dear Hans fully three days before he arrived. He used to say that Bülow's noble, chivalrous character should be a model for all artists. Liszt's Danse Macabre was dedicated to Bülow with these words, to the high-souled herald of our art, dem hochherzigen Progonen unseren Kunst. I cannot read the title High-souled herald without emotion. In these two words there lies such boundless esteem for the artist and the man, and in uttering them Liszt raised Bülow nearer to his own inaccessible height. But he loved Tausig no less than he loved Bülow. If any of us brought one of Tausig's compositions, Liszt invariably had it played, and would tell us each time what a wonderful pianist he was. He used to say it would have been better for art if a dozen contemporary pianists had died instead of Tausig. He was fond of telling the following story of one of Tausig's practical jokes. After the final concert of one of the Allgemeine Deutsche Musikvereins festivals, there was to be a banquet at which all the performers and the distinguished visitors would be present. I noticed that Tausig disappeared before the end of the concert. When I came to the banquet, I saw him standing aloof in a corner, declining to take his seat at table. When all the company were seated, there was a dead, awkward silence in place of the usual hum of conversation. I did not realize what had happened at first, but when I caught sight of Tausig wearing a knowing smile, I beckoned to him and asked the meaning of it. He then confessed that he had left before the end of the concert on purpose to change the places of the guests so that people who were not in harmony with each other should sit side by side. In the spring of 1886, Liszt told me he wished to go to Russia at the request of his favorite pupil, Madame Sophie Menter, at that time professor at the St. Petersburg Conservatorium, but that he could not make up his mind to the journey unless he received a personal invitation written by Alexander the Third, or the Empress Marie Feodorovna. I was surprised that he should make such a condition, and he proceeded to tell me how he came to do so. I was giving concerts in Russia, and received a command to play before the Emperor Nicholas I. While I was playing, the Emperor beckoned to his aide-de-camp and began talking to him, whereupon I stopped. There was an uncomfortable silence. Then the Emperor came up to me and asked why I had stopped. I said, When your Majesty speaks, everybody else must be silent. He did not take my meaning at first, but looked at me for a moment as if puzzled. Then, all of a sudden, he frowned and said curtly, Monsieur Liszt, your carriage is waiting. I bowed in silence and went away. Half an hour later, a police officer came to my hotel 
and ordered me to leave Petersburg within six hours, which I did. That is why I can only return to Petersburg at the personal invitation of another emperor, and that is what I am waiting for. And he was right. There came a letter written by the Empress Marie Feodorovna's own hand with a note added by Alexander the Third, in which Liszt was invited to stay at the Winter Palace. Liszt made me, as he put it, his great chamberlain. It was my duty to decide whom to admit to him and to announce the visitors. It was arranged that I should give concerts in Petersburg and Moscow in Liszt's presence, and he even gave me his promise to play, saying, Make no formal announcement of this, but let it be known. It will add something to your receipts, and the state of your finances will be improved in consequence, even without help from the Moscow Musical Society. Providence ordained otherwise. In June, Liszt went on a visit to his friend, the painter, Moncazzi in Paris, where he was present at all the concerts given in his honor. He returned to Weimar, suffering from a bad cold. Soon after this he was due to go to Bayreuth for the Wagner performances. A few hours before he left, I went to say good-bye to him and found him lying on a couch. He was rather feverish, but looked much the same as when he was well. The expression on his face was like nothing earthly. It was about six o'clock in the evening. The sun was setting. In his study it was about twilight. We began to talk, and he told me where he had taken cold. I tried to persuade him not to go to Bayreuth, but he said he was obliged to go, that there were moments when refusal was impossible and that his refusal to go to Bayreuth just then would make an unfavorable impression. As usual before a separation, there were pauses in our talk. Suddenly he said, Yes, Zelotissimus, I realize all that you have done for me, and am grateful beyond measure. When I die, you may feel assured that I understood it, felt it all. I thank you for everything, and shall never forget it. This almost stunned me. I was choked by tears, and could only whisper, Meister, please, stop. Why these thanks, and what deeds of mine are you speaking of? But he waved his hand at me, saying, No, no, I know what I am saying. Once more, remember that I have understood everything and shall never forget it. That same evening he went to Bayreuth. I promised to go over and see him, and when I received the news that his cold was no better, I went and stayed a whole day with him. He was sitting in an armchair, ill, and was glad to see me, as one whom he loved. He was living in a moderate-sized house, opposite the left façade of Wagner's villa. In the evening I went away, promising to come back in a week's time. I did come back in a week, but to find him no longer living. I had received a telegram early that morning, July 31st, announcing his death, and I left for Bayreuth in half an hour, arriving there about nine o'clock in the evening. I find it impossible to describe what I felt as I passed the railings outside Wagner's house and turned to the right where Liszt lived. It was twilight, and just as I entered the street I heard the mournful howl of a dog. It proved to be Wagner's dog, who, after his master's funeral, had lain down beside the grave, neither howling nor moving from that time forward. This dog, at the moment of Liszt's death, had suddenly started howling. When I heard it, I began to tremble all over. 
I do not remember how I got to the house, how I entered the room and saw him lying dead. Some of List's pupils were already there, and we decided to form a guard of honor round his body. Three days later, the funeral took place. The day before, Cosima Wagner's son-in-law told me that she had given orders that she and her children should walk immediately behind the coffin. After them, the artists from the Bayreuth Theatre, and after them, we, Liszt's pupils. I told him to tell Cosima Wagner that she could give any orders she pleased, but that my friends and I would walk immediately behind the coffin, for this reason, that we were nearer in spirit to Liszt than all the inhabitants of Bayreuth. When it was objected that the order was already given, I replied that I would allow no change in my arrangement, but that Frau Wagner might, if she pleased, ask the police to send us away from the funeral altogether. I probably spoke with great determination, because everything happened according to my wishes, and we walked the whole of the way close behind the coffin. This attempt to give us the third place in order of precedence behind the coffin, which of course had not been intentional, depressed us deeply, and when Frau Wagner sent us all tickets for the two following performances of Tristan, our young blood was up, and we rewarded her with a little demonstration of hostility. We neither gave away the tickets nor used the seats ourselves, but during the intervals we obtruded ourselves among the audience. It was not politic, I dare say, but an honest expression of our youthful temperaments. After Liszt's death we were scattered to all quarters of the globe, but even from another sphere the spell of his wonderful personality still binds us. Arthur Friedheim, who for fifteen years had neither seen me nor written to me, sent me a postcard in the sixteenth year which began, Long live our old man and our friendship. And when I saw Felix Mottel, after a lapse of twenty years, we had to own that while we talked or listened to each other, it seemed as if the old man were standing between us, that during all those years, whenever anything has happened to us, we always remembered to stop and think what the old man would say, and what he would advise us to do. And this influence, this presence of list in our midst, pervades even our music, because we approach it in the same manner as our master. It would seem as if our last and happiest remembrance before we die must needs be of our list days. Only now in the downhill of life do we understand whom we saw, whom we had with us, who it was that remained the guiding star of our whole life. I could envy myself for having lived through such an epoch, and I shall thank Providence until I draw my last breath for giving me the bliss of seeing, knowing, and hearing this great man. The End